Hi, welcome to part four of the KLH Model 8 restoration series. In this video, I'm going to be replacing all of the paper and electrolytic caps underneath the chassis. Um, we'll test them all, see if we can identify if one may have caused the problems that we were having at the outset, and then we'll fire it up again and see if we have sound from the RF section. So if that sounds cool, stick around. There wasn't a whole lot of interesting stuff to share with um, regards to actually replacing the capacitors in here. It's pretty straightforward. It's just identifying the values of the ones that are in there and replacing them one by one. So I've gone ahead and done that. All of the old paper capacitors and um, a single electrolytic have all been replaced. So next up, we're gonna go over everything that was pulled out of this unit, test each capacitor, and see if we can identify which one may have been causing our lack of uh, radio frequency reception. Here are all the capacitors that I pulled out of the unit. I'm going to take these one by one and test them and we'll see if we can identify one that may have been causing some issues. So this one is supposed to be around 0 0.047 microfarad. So first I'm going to check value with a LCR meter here. So that's testing pretty well. I've also got a leakage test that I can do here. This is a tester that I built based on instructions from um, uh, Mr. Carlson's lab. He has a Patreon page with some of his um, devices on it. And this is a really useful capacitor tester. So this one passes the leakage test. This capacitor is fine. So this probably was not causing our issues. Moving on. This one I don't know if I'm going to be able to test. I had to clip it very, very close. I don't think I'm going to be able to test this one, unfortunately. But this is just the 0.1 microfarad that um, was actually in circuit during the test in video two. So I'm pretty confident that that one's fine. It's been replaced regardless. This one is 0 0.008 microfarad. Well, pretty much dead on the spot. For value, let's check the leakage. And it's possible that this capacitor type is not actually paper and it's a, a different um, like mylar or some other combination that holds up better. That one was fine. And this had been serviced in the past. Um, it's possible that these were all replaced, but I doubt it. Somebody that's worked on a lot of these might be able to identify if this uh, specific type was ever used in the eight or not. All right, next up we have 0 0.03 microfarad. Again, good on value. And on this leakage tester, I'm using the forecast setting, which is the ultra sensitive setting. And my general rule of thumb is if I'm putting in a capacitor and it can't pass this forecast test, I don't put it in the unit. Since this value is a little bit higher, it takes a little bit longer for the tester to, um, to verify it. Also good. All right. This one is another of the same, 0 0.03. Good. Again, I've got this one cut pretty short, 0 0.006. Good. That's it for the red one, so all of those were fine. Let's check this one out. Fine for leakage. This is another point. Well, actually, this was the only point zero zero three. Change the range on this. 
Yeah, so basically all of the green and blue caps were fine. For the electrolytic, this is a little bit higher value. This is 4.7. Well, we can try it on the LCR meter. It's not looking very good. It was five point or five microfarad here. This one will use the peak ESR seventy. So that is an open capacitor. So all of these were good. And we did get performance out of the audio section, so that was fine. But this one is actually located in a very important part of the RF circuit. Let's look at that on the schematic. So if we look at the schematic, that 4.7 is, let's see, I think it's written in as five microfarad here somewhere. It's this guy right here, five microfarad electrolytic. So that is part of the RF circuit here and definitely could be contributing to not receiving anything. So I'm gonna load the tubes back in and we'll fire this thing up and see if we can get audio through it. All right, I have a 16 ohm dummy load connected and uh, this will be our first time powering it up with the capacitor changes. So let's see what we've got. So we've got the neon here see if it stays on it's been kind of intermittent oh yeah look at that I'll have to look into that you hear that it seems pretty sensitive too Picking up a lot of stations. Great, so. So it's fundamentally working. That's good. So it was probably that five microfarad electrolytic that was um, causing that initial issue. I'm still gonna probably retube this whole uh, receiver because of those issues that we, we saw during the vacuum tube testing where one triad was very weak and it doesn't have a lot of output power. So um, I guess that's next, I'll retube it. I also need to figure out what's going on with this neon. Uh, it seems like the bulb is fine, but something's going on with the voltage on it. So I'll have to look into that a little bit further. I'm gonna take a look at this neon first. So I'm hoping this is something simple, uh, like the, the voltage is starting high and then coming too low and the lamp can't light, or the, the, um, the neon is just inconsistent and needs to get replaced. So I've gone ahead and desoldered the whole perimeter uh, around this shield here of the front end. Now I got this out. So the neon is this device right here, it's kind of hard to see, it's underneath the clip, but I've got this one leg coming down to this resistor, and then the other one is soldered directly to the chassis. So what I'm gonna do is start out by measuring the voltage um, at that point and compare it to the schematic value. So I'll get that set up and we'll measure that at power on and see what the condition is when the, the lamp uh, extinguishes. Okay, so the neon uh, indicator lamp is located right here. The schematic shows goes through a 68K resistor and then up to this point, which sits at 107 volts, which corresponds to pin three of this tube here. The 6U8 is the one that's located underneath this shielded chassis. So I know I have to be on pin three here, which is where I have this black wire attached. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and power this up and let's see what this voltage does as the unit stabilizes. So we're looking for that 107 volts. Um, it's kind of hard to see, but the neon is on right now. You can see it just through the um, through this area here. So as this warms up, we're coming down in voltage and the neon is getting dimmer. Yeah, 
it's still on. And it seems to be stable there. I'm going to rotate the um, tuning a little bit. Oh, it just went out. I don't think that corresponded with me making that adjustment. I think it was just a timing thing or just coincidence. So let me tap on some connections here and see if we can get this to come back. Now let's check the voltage on the other side of this resistor. I mean the voltage is there and it's, ab it's above that 107. I'm guessing that this lamp is just intermittent. So what I'm going to do is clip a different lamp in and we'll see if it stays steady. All right, so what I've done here is I desoldered the original neon lamp and I just have a clip lead going across that um, dropping resistor going to a brand new neon and the other end is going to the chassis. So let's power this up and see what happens. So what the other neon did was as this drops down to around 110 volts, this got dimmer and then eventually it completely extinguished, um, which seemingly was related to how much time the unit was powered on. I'm not seeing a whole lot of change here as the voltage drops. It seems like the lighting level has been pretty consistent. Yeah, I'm thinking it was just a bad lamp. So to be sure, I'm going to clip the other one back in and make sure that it fails again. So I'm going to turn this off and I just need to take this clip and get it back onto the leg of this neon. It's kind of tight in here. I don't want to short anything out. I'm just going to make this a little bit more solid. Okay, so we should be back in business here with the original. Let's fire it up. I'm going to move the camera so that we can see the, the neon from the front. Yeah, that's weird. So there wasn't much of a change in voltage, but maybe it's something to do with touching the chassis. It seems to always reset itself when it's powered off and powered back on, it comes back. Um, the other one was stable while I adjusted this. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna put in a new resistor and this new neon, and we will test it again once that's in place. Okay, so I've replaced the neon in here. And what I had to do, and this is another thing that was in that guide, I swapped, this was a rivet, I had to drill out the rivet, I drilled out the rivet from the front side and then I found a 440 screw and nut and was able to re-secure the new neon uh, with a screw and nut there. Then I reproduced the, the regular connections, I decided to leave this resistor in place and this is another reason why I think that that original neon is what was acting up. This resistor was reading around 150k with the um, original neon in place and it wasn't steady, it was bouncing all over the place, almost like the neon had developed some sort of capacitance or something. So when I took out the old neon, I measured across this and it was at 115K and it was steady. Uh, it's a little bit outside of tolerance, but for a lamp circuit, it's fine. So I'm gonna leave the original resistor in place. Once I soldered this neon in, I redid that measurement and it was 115K. So there was definitely something going on with this other neon, uh, the original one. So let's power this up and see if this one stays steady uh, after the power up sequence and tuning adjustment. 
So I'm going to give this just a minute to go through its cycle. And we can see there's almost no, uh, no dimming really that's happening to this as it goes down. It should give us a nice indicator on the, on the front panel. All right, let's turn up the volume a little bit. So I think we're good. It's just a bad neon. Um, so I'm going to get the cover soldered back onto this section and we'll move on to something else. Okay, let's take a closer look at this audio output circuit. Um, I wanted to explain this phase inverter function. So basically whether we're receiving a signal from the tuner or from uh, an auxiliary input source, the signal is going to be coming into pin 7 of uh, this vacuum tube. The signal that's coming in is going to be non-inverted, let's say. Once it comes through this vacuum tube, it's going to come out of this plate through this capacitor, through the volume control, and arrive at the grid of this tube. This is the first triode section of one of the output uh, ECL82s. Uh, when it comes out of this plate, sorry, I missed something here. At, at this point, this is going to invert when it comes through this tube stage. It's going to invert again here. So the signal comes in through the grid and out the plate. Now it matches the input signal at the grid here. And then there's going to be a final inversion here across the output transformer. Now in order for this circuit to work, these tubes need to get an equal and opposite signal uh, so that they work in push-pull across this output transformer. So the way that that happens is this signal comes down through this voltage divider and it arrives at the grid of this tube. So this is the second triode section. Here, it gets inverted again. I'm gonna put a blue line on here just for clarity. So at this point in the circuit, pin three of the pentode section of each of these ECL82s is getting an equal and opposite signal. So that when it takes its final inversion, through this, we have equal and opposite across the output transformer on the plates of the tubes. So I'm going to show what that looks like on an oscilloscope. So what I'm doing is I'm probing at pin 3 of each of these. So I showed this a little bit earlier. I'm basically probing here and here. So the signal that's feeding the, the final output tube grids. So if we look up at the scopes, back this out. I'm going to raise the volume control. So this is just with a sine wave fed in. And we can see a, a clean sine wave output here. This is across the dummy load. And then this is what's going on at pin 3. I'm going to turn this down so that we can hear. So we have close to equal and opposite waveforms here feeding pin 3 of each of these tubes. Now the problem that I'm seeing, if I can get this up here on the scope, is that they're not actually equal. Um, these should cross at the zero crossing exactly. They should be the same amplitude in the same shape. And I'm going to take this up a little bit. And we can see how that purple waveform is no longer maintaining that clean sine wave shape. This is my first time working on this circuit, so I'm not exactly sure if this is how it's supposed to be or not. Um, there is one thing that I noticed which I'm going to, um, to change, which is usually during one of these restorations, this uh, capacitor here is not changed, this 0.01 microfarad, but that's playing a key role. That's in the audio path feeding this circuit. I doubt this is contributing to that waveform shape that I'm seeing, but that's this capacitor right here, and generally you don't want ceramic in the signal path. So I'm going to go ahead and replace that capacitor just as part of this uh, restoration. I'm not sure it's going to change anything, but we'll look at the end result um, and see if it makes a difference. The other thing that I noticed is when I clip this output stage, sorry for the shoddy camera work here, 
when I clip this output stage, I'm only producing about one, one and a half watts maybe at clipping into a 16 ohm load. So I'm, I'm clipping pretty good right there. I'm at maybe two watts, uh, which I'm not sure if that's normal or not for this circuit across a 16 ohm load. But I can tell you when I put it on the cabinet and I turn it up, it is really quite loud. So I think it's operating how it's supposed to be, but I would expect a little bit more output power out of a push-pull um, pair like that. All right, so let me swap in that capacitor. We'll repeat this test and see if there's any changes in the waveforms. I put in this new capacitor and redid the tests, and as expected, there was really no change. Um, again, this is my first time working on, uh, on this specific circuit and analyzing it in detail. Um, so without a second one to compare it to, I don't know if it's normal or not. What I can tell you is the output waveform is clean and it seems to have plenty of volume to drive the speaker cabinet. So I'm happy with, with how this turned out as is. If it was a um, high fidelity amplifier, I would be thinking that there's still an issue that exists. But on something like this, it may just be part of the design and how that phase inverter circuit works. So I'm going to move on to putting this into the cabinet. And I just want to get an idea of how close the dial tracking is uh, to see if I need to do an alignment on this or not. All right, the final check that I want to do is just a, a quick look at the dial tracking and see how close it tracks. Um, if it's way off, I'll definitely have to do an alignment. If it's off by a little bit, I might just tweak it to, to get it a little bit more accurate. Um, so in Manhattan, I'm lucky because I have some really strong stations at strategic points in the dial. So I've got 90.7, which gives me a low end reference, uh, 97.9, which tells me how good my center uh, tracking is once the once you've lined up the the outsides of the band it, how close it is to center and then I've got 103.9 which is nice and strong in the upper end I also have 106.7 but I don't know if I'm gonna be able to catch that it's not as strong as the other three um, so while this is warming up I just wanted to mention that in the tests I did with the phase inverter I have installed a brand new set of tubes in this thing so all the tests that we we saw in this part were done with a on a new set of, of tubes, both in the audio and the tuner sections. Um, so I don't think it's a tube related thing. And I did uh, swap the originals back in with no change. So yeah, I don't think it's a tube thing. If I get another KLH Model 8 someday, I will definitely do these same comparisons and see if um, if that's consistent with all eights or if it's, uh, if it's actually something that's wrong with this one. But again, the main thing is the, the output waveform is clean and it has plenty of power to drive the speaker. So, um, Let's get some audio here, and I'm going to try to aim for 90.7. And that should be it right there, a little under 91. That's looking good. Let's go for 97.9. It's a Latin station. Yeah, it's right around there, so a little under 98, which is where we want. So 103.9 is talk radio. According to Time Out New York, and Variety says... Cash oh, there it is. So it's a little above 104, so I'm, I'm starting to lose my accuracy in the upper end. And this may be 106.7, which is showing above 107. So I think I definitely have an issue in the in the top end of my range, which, I mean, it receives, but um, I'd like this to be as accurate as possible. So I have all the equipment I need to do a sweep alignment, but there's no documentation of how to do the alignment on this one, so I'm going to need to study up a little bit more. I'm fine with solid state receivers. A lot of the stuff I work on is PLL circuits and the manuals just give me all the test points that I need and I just set up my equipment and, and do the alignment. Uh, but for something like this, I really do need to study up and uh, and learn like more of the universal principles before I try to align this thing because I don't want to mess anything up. So I don't know which video is going to be next in the series. It might be an alignment video. Otherwise, I will get started on cleaning the faceplate and refinishing the cabinets. So thanks again for stopping by the channel for this part and I will catch you for the next one.